Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and for today's lesson we will be exploring different areas of biology that provide evidence that evolution has taken place in the past and is still happening today. The evidence for evolution is compelling and extensive and comes from many different areas of biology. We will explore nine of them. Evidence from fossils, evidence from anatomy like homologous structures, analogous structures, vestigial structures, and comparative embryology. Evidence from molecular biology, which compares proteins and DNA from different species. Evidence from biogeography, which is the global distribution of organisms. And also direct observation in the form of artificial selection. So let's dive in. Let's start with the fossil record. Fossils are the preserved remains of previously living organisms, or their traces imprinted in rock. The fossil record is certainly not complete or unbroken. Most organisms never fossilize, and even the organisms that do fossilize are rarely found by humans. But nevertheless, the fossils that humans have collected offer unique insights into evolution over long time scales. But to understand how fossils provide evidence for evolution, we first need to understand a little something about the rocks in which fossils are found. So fossils are found in layers of rock called sedimentary rock. And sedimentary rock is rock that is formed in layers as sediments like sand, clay, silt, and dead organisms settle somewhere and get covered by more layers of sediment. When over a long time, layers and layers of sediments get deposited on top of each other, the weight of the top layers tends to press down on the bottom layers, forming them into rock called sedimentary rock. The oldest layers are on the bottom, and the youngest layers are on the top. So because the sediments sometimes include one's living organisms, sedimentary rock often contain a lot of fossils, which means that fossils that are found in deeper layers of rock are older than those found in the top layers. So when looking at fossils based on the layers in which they're found, we find that fossils from the bottom layers are simpler and very different from the organisms alive today. As we look further up at younger and younger rock layers, the fossilized plants and animals become more and more familiar until they are a lot like the organisms that are around us now. Not only that, but the organisms also tend to become more and more complex the younger and younger the rock gets. So fossil species found within different rock layers reflect different time periods of Earth's history, with layers of rocks of different ages containing different types of species from those above them and from those below them. For example, the beginning of the Cambrian period at the start of the Paleozoic era is the time when the first invertebrate organisms with shells were the dominant species. Trilobites, in particular, are found in large numbers in the fossil record from that time period. One other important thing to note is that fossils of organisms found in younger layers have never been found in older layers. So we would never find the fossil of a dinosaur or a mammal, for example, in layers from the Paleozoic era, because those types of animals simply did not exist at the time those deeper layers of rock were formed. So the layers of the fossil record and the relative age of the fossils show us that life on Earth has changed over time. And not just a little bit. The life that we see around us, the life that exists on Earth today, despite its amazing biodiversity, contains less than 1% of the species that are found in the fossil record. More than 99% of all the species that ever existed on Earth are extinct, and current species are just a tiny sample of all the forms of life that have ever lived on this planet. So then, how are fossils evidence that support evolution? How are fossils evidence that species change over time? Well, fossils show us a few things. First, by dating fossils and the rocks in which they are found, we can prove that there's been life on Earth for a very, very long time, about 3.5 billion years. And by the way, I did not cover the process by which fossils are dated. It mostly involves a process called radiometric dating that uses radioactive isotopes of elements, something you will learn a little bit more about in grade 12 biology and maybe some of your other science courses. But an understanding that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old and that life has existed on Earth for about 3.5 billion years is important 
because the process of evolution that would lead to the diversity and complexity of organisms we see today requires a lot of time. Another thing that the fossil record can show us is the progression as organisms change over time. Of course, there is some extrapolation as to what the organisms to which the fossils belong to look like. For example, this is the fossil of a whale ancestor called Ambulocetus, and this is an artist rendering of what Ambulocetus might have looked like based on its fossil. Regardless, our look at the fossil record, although incomplete, provides a picture of how organisms alive today may have evolved, and as more fossils are discovered, this picture becomes clearer. For example, in April of 2004, the fossil of a fish that lived 375 million years ago was discovered in Nunavut, Canada. It was named Tiktaalik, an inactivated word meaning large freshwater fish, and its discovery made headlines because it shed some light on a pivotal point in the history of life on Earth, namely, when and how the very first fish ventured out onto land. And that is because Tiktaalik is technically a fish, complete with scales and gills, but it has the flattened head of a crocodile and unusual fins. Its fins have thin ray bones for paddling, like most fishes, but they also have sturdy interior bones that would have allowed Tiktaalik to prop itself up in shallow water and use its limbs for support as most four-legged animals do. Those fins, and some other characteristics, like um, a set of partial lungs, set Tiktaalik apart as something special. It has a combination of features that show the evolutionary transition between swimming fish and their descendants, the four-legged vertebrates. Now, at that time, in many news articles, Tiktaalik was heralded as the missing link between fish and land vertebrates. But that description is a bit misleading. There really are no missing links. Fossils like Tiktaalik are more accurately described as a transitional form than a missing link. Transitional forms have shown the evolutionary steps leading from one group of species to another. Fossils, especially fossils like Tiktaalik, are extremely important to the study of Earth's evolutionary past. Now let's talk about how comparing the anatomy of present-day species can provide us with evidence that they evolved from a common ancestor. And let's start with homologous structures. If we notice that two or more species share a unique physical feature, like for example a complex bone structure in their arms, then they may all have inherited that feature from a common ancestor. And we call these physical structures that are similar because of a shared ancestor homologous structures or homologous traits. And what makes homologous structures more revealing of a shared ancestry is when they are the same in different species even though they use them for completely different purposes. A classic example of this is the forelimbs of vertebrates, like for example, bats, whales, cats, and humans. On the outside, the forelimbs of these animals are very different. I have a cat, and as much as I like to occasionally give my cat some high fives, it is very clear that our arms and hands are very different. To start, my cat does not have hands and the wing of a bat and the flipper of a whale are even more different than my hand is to my cat's paw. And that's because these limbs, all four of them, are adapted to different environments and for different functions, like flying or swimming or running and capturing prey or holding tools. But when you look at the bone structure of the forelimbs, you'll find that the pattern of bones is very similar across species of all vertebrates. There is a humerus, and a radius and ulna, and there's wrist bones, and even hand and finger bones in all of these limbs. It's unlikely that such similar structures would have evolved independently in each species. What is more likely is that this basic layout of bones was already present in a common ancestor of whales, bats, cats, and humans. Which brings us to another term, divergent evolution. Divergent evolution happens when two or more different species share a common ancestor, but have different characteristics from one another. So all mammals share a common ancestor, but have evolved a variety of vastly different characteristics as adaptations to their own environment. However, deep down, there are many similarities or shared homologous characteristics that were passed down from that common ancestor. For example, 
Besides the forelimb bones that are shared with all mammals, whales and other cetaceans, like dolphins, also have lungs, just like all mammals do. Despite the fact that they live exclusively in the oceans, whales breathe air through the lungs that they inherited from their land-dwelling ancestors. To make things a little bit more interesting and complicated, not all physical features that look alike are marks of common ancestry. Instead, some physical similarities are what we call analogous. Analogous structures are traits that evolved independently in different organisms, but look similar because the organisms lived in similar environments or experienced similar selective pressures. This evolutionary process is called convergent evolution. To converge means to come together. For example, both sharks and dolphins have similar body forms, yet are only distantly related. Sharks are fish, and dolphins are mammals. So their similarities are a result of both populations being exposed to the same selective pressures. Both groups live in the water and the oceans, and within both groups, changes that help with swimming have been favored. So over time, they develop similar appearances, even though they're not closely related. Deep down, however, when we take a close look at their anatomy, their differences become obvious, like for example, the fact that one breathes through gills and has a skeleton made out of cartilage, and the other breathes through lungs and has a skeleton made of bones. Sometimes organisms have structures that are homologous to important structures in related species, but have lost their function. These structures and organs, which are often reduced in size, are known as vestigial structures or vestigial organs. A common example of a vestigial structure is the hind leg bone found in whales. That's right, even though whales do not have back legs or flippers, they actually have pelvic bones. They are evolutionary remnants from when their ancestors walked on land more than 40 million years ago. They're there, even though they don't have any back or hind legs. But whales and dolphins are not the only legless vertebrates with pelvic bones. Small bones that are called pelvic spurs which are the vestigial remnants of legs, are actually visible on the bottom side of some snake species, like, for example, boas and pythons. And these remnants of leg bones have no connection to the spine and just simply float internally in the muscle of those snakes. Another example of vestigial structures are vestigial eyes. There are species of animals that are blind, but still have reduced and non-functioning eyes that remain due to being descendant from sighted ancestors with functional eyes. A species of fish that lives in caves deep down underground off the coast of Mexico cannot see, but they actually form eyes as embryos. And then as it's developing in the egg, the eyes begin to degenerate, and the fish are born with collapsed remnants of an eye that is covered by a flap of skin. Similarly, there's a Texas blind salamander that lives deep in a dark aquifer and has no eyes, but does have vestigial optic nerves with no eyes connected to it. And there's a blind mole rat that has tiny eyes that are completely covered by a layer of skin. And as the name implies, the blind mole rat is completely blind. These blind mole rats spend most of their time digging underground in the dark, looking for roots and underground vegetation to eat. Their eyes actually do begin to form as they develop, but a layer of skin grows over them, and then their lenses and corneas do not form correctly. What's interesting about them is that scientists that have studied these mammals have actually determined that the cells in their eyes could still respond to light, but no light ever reaches those cells because they are currently located underneath a layer of skin and fur. So the fact that the eyes are still kind of there and semi-functional is just a vestigial trait, a remnant of their evolutionary past. And there are many more examples of vestigial structures, some even in humans, and I could make an entire video lesson just talking about them. But we do need to move on, and there is still one comparative anatomy evidence of evolution, and that is comparative embryology, the comparison of embryos of different species. It turns out that embryos of many different kinds of animals, like mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, etc., look very similar and it is often difficult to tell them apart. Many traits of one type of animal appear in the embryo of another type of animal. For example, fish embryos and human embryos both have gill slits 
Now, these gill slits are not really gills. They are slits that are found in the throat during early development. In fish and in larval amphibians, they contribute to the development of the gills and in turn become gills. But in reptiles and birds and in mammals, they close and become parts of other structures. For example, in mammals, the tissue between the first gill slits forms part of the lower jaw and the bones of the inner ear. A comparison of embryos of different species also shows us that the more closely related species are, the more similar their embryos will look. In this diagram, you can see that although all of these embryos look very similar at the earlier stages of development, as they each develop further, they start to look more and more different from each other. However, fish and amphibian embryos, reptile and bird embryos, and mammal embryos continue to look very similar into later stages of embryonic development evidence of common ancestry. Like we saw with comparative anatomy, similarities between biological molecules can reflect shared evolutionary ancestry. DNA is considered a universal genetic code because every known living organism on Earth has genes made of DNA. Bacteria, fungi, cats, plants, you, every organism uses DNA to store genetic information. All organisms also use DNA to transcribe RNA and then they translate RNA into proteins. So every living thing on Earth uses the same system of coding information in our genes and using that information for making proteins. Basically, every three letters of DNA codes for one amino acid. The amino acid that is being coded for depends upon that three-letter sequence, which is called a codon. And pretty much every organism on Earth uses that same system to code for the same 20 amino acids and it is those same 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins of every organism on Earth. This is all evidence of a common ancestor to all living things on Earth. And not only is the genetic code that is used to build proteins the same, but we will find the same proteins in many different species. Shared proteins are evidence of shared ancestry and having inherited a very similar genetic code. At times, the amino acid sequence of those same proteins are actually identical. More often, though, they tend to differ by a certain number of amino acids. These differences are a result of the mutations in the DNA code that have accumulated since a species diverged from a common ancestor. For example, all vertebrates, from fish to humans, produce the protein hemoglobin within their blood cells. A comparison of the amino acid sequence of the hemoglobin found in humans with the hemoglobin found in different species provides evidence of how closely related other species are to our own. Because the DNA sequence determines a protein's amino acid sequence, a gene that is shared by two closely related organisms should have similar or even identical amino acid sequences. That's because closely related species most likely diverge from one another fairly recently. They haven't had as much time to accumulate random mutations in their genetic code. So comparison of protein sequences can then give us some evidence as to the relatedness of different organisms. A 2008 study, for example, compared the sequences of a collagen protein recovered from the bones of a 68-million-year-old T. rex fossil and a half-million-year-old mastodon with those same sequences from 21 modern animals. The family tree that was produced using the collagen evidence proved that the mastodon was an ancestor to modern elephants, something that surprised no one. But it also showed that out of all the modern animals analyzed, T. rex had the closest relationship to birds, chickens in particular. This made headlines at the time, because although the relationship of dinosaurs to birds had already been proposed by paleontologists based on fossil evidence, like the evidence of feathered dinosaurs, this study showed a biochemical relationship between the species. Similar collagen sequences is evidence of similar DNA sequences, and therefore common ancestry. In speaking of DNA, while comparing proteins can indirectly provide evidence of similarities in the genetic code, so can, of course, comparing the genetic code directly. And this is done through a process called DNA hybridization. As you learn in our genetics unit, DNA is double-stranded and is held together by hydrogen bonds between complementary base pairs. When heat is added, the hydrogen bonds holding the two strands of DNA can break, separating the two strands. When separated, DNA strands from different species can then be mixed together, 
If the two strands from different species share similar sequences, they will hybridize, that is, they will hydrogen bond to each other to form a double strand. Later on, the amount of heat that would be needed to separate this hybrid molecule of DNA would indicate just how similar the two sequences are. More heat is proof that more hydrogen bonds form, meaning more complementary base pairing, meaning more similar genetic sequences. Less heat indicates fewer hydrogen bonds formed, meaning less base pairing has occurred because sequences are less similar. So biologists often compare the sequences of related genes found in different species to figure out how these species are evolutionarily related to one another. The basic premise behind this approach is that any similarities in the DNA sequence between the species is because they inherited the DNA from a common ancestor. The more similar the sequence, the closer the relationship. For example, a widely cited study from the 1980s using DNA hybridization concluded that humans and chimpanzees are more closely related to each other than chimpanzees and gorillas. Now let's switch gears and take a look at another area of evolutionary evidence called biogeographical evidence. Biogeography is the study of how species are distributed in geographic space and through geological time. That means which species we find where and when throughout the world. It turns out that the geographic distribution of organisms on Earth is not random, but instead follows patterns that are best explained by evolution and the movement of tectonic plates in the continents over geologic time. So a brief geology lesson. About 300 million years ago, Earth didn't have seven continents, but instead one massive supercontinent called Pangaea. Organism groups that had already evolved before the breakup of Pangaea tend to be distributed worldwide. In contrast, groups of species that evolved after the breakup tend to appear uniquely in smaller regions of Earth. For instance, there are unique groups of plants and animals on the northern and southern continents that can be traced to the split of Pangaea into two supercontinents during the Triassic period, Laurasia in the north and Gondwanaland in the south. The ratites, or flightless birds, like ostriches and emus, are distributed globally according to regions that were once part of Gondwana land before it split into different continents. One particular area of interest in biogeography is the unique species that are found in islands or in the continent of Australia. Because by being isolated and separated from other land masses by the oceans, Species that are found in these places tend to be unique to those areas, since they evolved in isolation from the mainland species. For example, most marsupials, a type of mammal that carry their young in a pouch, are found almost exclusively in Australia, where they evolve separately from the placental mammals that are found in the Americas. Biogeography shows us that related species are found in close proximity to each other, because despite the fact that many marsupial species look similar to those from America, they are more closely related to the species in their own continent. Like, for example, the marsupial flying phalanger and the placental flying squirrel of North America. These two species look very similar to each other. Both are tree-dwelling mammals that glide through the air with a parachute-like fold of furry skin between the front and hind legs. However, these similarities are a result of convergent evolution. They appear similar because they are both adapted to living in trees and moving between them more efficiently. The flying phalanger and the flying squirrels are completely different types of mammals. One is a placental mammal that evolved from a placental ancestor, and the other is a marsupial mammal that evolved from a marsupial ancestor that was also the ancestor to all Australian marsupials. Divergent evolution resulted in the variety of different marsupials found in Australia all descendants from a common ancestor, but adapted to different environments and niches within that continent. Finally, for our ninth area of evolutionary evidence, we will look at artificial selection, or the breeding of domesticated plants and animals, which proves that selection of certain traits, in this case selection by humans, can lead to substantial changes in a population over time. In our Introduction to Evolution lesson, we defined evolution as the change in heritable characteristics over many generations. 
Artificial selection proves that significant changes in species is possible even within the few generations since humans started the process of plant and animal domestication. For example, did you know that broccoli, kale, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, turnips, and cabbage are all related plant species, and that all of them are descendants of a single type of plant called the wild mustard that look nothing like these vegetables. How is that possible? It is possible through a process called selective breeding. Selective breeding, that is the process of choosing parents with particular characteristics to breed together and produce offspring, can create amazing variety. So in this example, over the last 2,000 years, farmers have selectively bred wild mustard into what seems like entirely different vegetables, but are actually genetically similar cousins. These plants look and taste the way they do because humans have chosen the characteristics that were beneficial to us and bred for them. And it's not just plants. Most farm animals and pets are also the products of selective breeding or artificial selection. You may have heard that all breeds of dogs are direct descendants of the gray wolf, in other words, dogs are basically domesticated wolves. Through the selection of specific traits, both behavioral and physical, the selective breeding of these animals by humans have resulted in over 150 breeds of incredible variety, from tiny teacup dogs that grow no taller than a pop can, to dogs that are taller than a human when standing up, from super fluffy dogs to hairless dogs, friendly dogs, to dogs that are bred specifically to be aggressive. Now, unfortunately, sometimes by selecting for specific animal traits, we might accidentally produce characteristics that are damaging to the animal's health. An example of that is bulldog and other flat-faced purebreds that have breathing problems due to the fact that they have been selected for that particular face shape. And selective breeding can also cause discomfort to farm animals. For instance, cows have been bred to produce large amounts of milk so much so that they are prone to other infections and discomfort. Sheep have been bred for their wool production, but as a result, most breeds require removal of that wool by regular shearing, or else the animal is at risk of overheating, discomfort, and disease. And selective breeding of chickens have not only resulted in the birds losing their ability to fly, but breeding them to increase their size can cause lung and heart problems, as well as joint and leg problems. So our experience with selective breeding proves that changes of a species over time is possible. Selective breeding is evolution by human selection, artificial selection, as opposed to evolution by natural selection. But human actions have also been the cause of evolution by natural selection. We can actually see evolution taking place all around us. Important examples of evolution caused by human actions include the emergence of drug-resistant bacteria and pesticide-resistant insects. In the 1950s, there was a worldwide effort to try to eradicate malaria by eliminating the mosquitoes that carried the disease. They used a pesticide called DDT and sprayed it everywhere in areas where the mosquitoes lived. And at first, the DDT was very effective at killing all the mosquitoes. But over time, the DDT became less and less effective and more and more mosquitoes survived, and this was because the mosquito population evolved a resistance to that pesticide. Unfortunately, we've been witnessing a very similar evolutionary process occurring with bacteria and antibiotics. Soon after the discovery of penicillin in the 1940s, the first strain of penicillin-resistant bacteria was discovered. And since then, strains of bacteria that have evolved resistance to several types of antibiotics a type of bacteria that we now call superbugs, have become a huge problem in the field of medicine. Their existence, however, is refutable evidence of evolution. And that's it for today's lesson. I will talk to you soon.